Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to Beyond Sunday. Thanks for being with us. We are back for part two of our final installment of our Q&A series. We just did A and now we're doing B. Yes. Yes. We have questions to ask each other. Yep. I've got a few to ask you. Yep. Um, but we begin as we always do. Yes. Okay. This. Shenanigans? We haven't done. Yeah. I'm very sure of it. Okay. And it's iconic. That's my jam right now. I'm going for the iconic theme songs. 70s? 70s. 70s. Hmm. Black and white. Um, like classic. Yeah. This was a show that I watched. I went to school and I walked home for lunch and then walked back. And when I was eating my lunch at home, this is the show that I watched. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just had this image when I was in elementary school of you as a little boy eating your PB and J and yep. apple slices, watching the show. kindergarten to third grade was when that, nice. that happened. It's a yeah. good, that's a good. Image. Then in fourth grade, the school changed. It was too far to go home. Yeah. So yeah, you ready? Yeah, bring it. Give me a sec. Give me a sec. I still haven't figured it out. Hold on. Starring Barbara Billingsley, Hugh Beaumont, I'm getting there. Tony Dow, wait, wait. And it's Jerry close. As what the is beaver. it? What is it? The Beaver. Just kidding. I never have watched Leave It to You've Beaver. You've never seen Leave It to Beaver? No. 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 Oh, my gosh. No, I know all about the Beav, but I don't know much... I never watched it. You got a leg up on me in some of these, these shows. Um, <laughs> leave it to Beaver. <laughs> yeah. So sixties? The beat maybe maybe. It was black and white. It had to start purely in 60s. black. And white. I don't. I I have no idea. Probably. I don't. I have no idea. Yeah. Maybe the sixties. Yeah. And it was, well, because it, it's, is it set in the 50s? Like, is it kind of describing that, that kind of quintessential as, 50s As a child of the 70s, of family, it's hard you know? for me to Very specific differentiate roles. the 50s and the 60s. Yeah. They, they blur together. But for it's me. known for having, you know, very specific gender roles, right? I mean, well, when was like uh, Father Knows Best and the Dick Van Dyke show? And I think. Well, like I think it, I think it's in with all of them. Andy yeah. Griffith. Maybe it was set in early '60s. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But it's a good show. Yeah. So, friends. Yeah. Uh, this is part two of Q and A. Yep. And we're gonna ask each other yeah. our questions. I wrote down. I wrote wrote down a couple questions. Okay. Yeah. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. Robert, if you hadn't decided to be a pastor, what do you think you'd be doing today? That was my question for you, damn it. <laughs> Good, I can start thinking about it. Uh, well, I was a psychology undergrad. Yeah. Um, and so I think, well, when I applied to seminary, I also applied for psychology master's and PhD programs. Um, mm -hmm. And ultimately came down to, to, to choosing a path. And so I, I deferred at the psych program for a year because I wasn't sure if I would mm. like seminary. And, and I went, so I guess I would, I would be pursuing um, psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, and my intention in that was always to be a therapist. So, mm. uh, yeah, I nice. guess that's my answer. Yeah. How about um, you? Uh, yeah, it's... I, I've thought about it recently, just kind of wondering what would I have done? Because right after undergrad, I went right into youth ministry and I have kind of, this is all I've done mm -hmm. um, to the point where I don't know what else I would do. Like, I got nowhere you, else you to go. You don't have an answer? <laughs> no, I do. I do. Oh, so dang. my um, my undergrad was, I finally finally selected a major when I was a junior. <laughs> Seriously, I was like forced. They, they kind of said, you have to select something. I never knew. 
And so uh, I was a communications major with an emphasis in TV and video production. So we're going back to um, late 90s where we were still like editing on VHS. Like this is like we had a uh, we had a um, computer edit, I mean, editing machine, but we were just starting to get you. They really didn't want us to use it that much. They wanted us to to use they wanted us to use the laborious kind of VHS editing that was oh, painful at times. But I would I'd be somewhere in that. I don't know what if I would have. I, I've always wondered. A sports producer. If I would have kind of just gotten something within ESPN. So I grew up 15 minutes from right, ESPN right, headquarters. Right, right, right. Would I have started there working like third shift and just work my way up? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I was going to be kind of packing things up and going to Hollywood and just hoping to be in production there in the production department. Um, mm. uh, but I I loved it. I, I loved TV and video production, um, and still love. I love the like behind the scenes stuff. Well, you're of, a cinephile. I mean, you know your making. movies. You are, well, and I love impressive. kind of going behind the scenes and kind of learning about how it's made. I love documentaries on movies. I just eat that stuff up. So cool, something like that. Yeah. Now, do I get to ask you one? Or uh, is this all you to me? No. You, I'm going to ask you one, and then you can ask me one. And I can answer these two. But, um, well, that was your question. You don't have any other questions. I, yeah, I do. Okay. All right, go ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to make them up. I'm sorry. If, if your family could pick up and move with you, and there were no financial repercussions yeah. for this, and you could live anywhere in the world, mm. anywhere, where would you want to live? My gosh, what a good question. Um... <clears throat> Hmm. If I could live anywhere, um, man, it's such a good question. I struggle with it so much because there's part of me that loves kind of being close to a city. And there's part of me that just wants to go off the grid. <laughs> just go off the grid. Um, and uh, so where I am right now, I think um, I'd want to go out of the country just to what's it like to live out of the country? I've, I've, I've asked that recently. Um, I've been out of the country, but what about living out of the country? So where would I go? Gosh, um, I don't know. I, You're really putting thought into this. I know this. because I really don't have an answer. Um, uh, I watched a documentary in Iceland recently, and I think I'd love to go. It, uh, Iceland is just so different than anywhere else. Yeah. Um, I'd want to go to this this kind of topography and terrain that is so different and live in a very different way, right? Just see what that's like. That is such a jewel answer. <laughs> that fits you so well. Just um, get away from everything kind of – detach from the machine a little bit um yeah and uh yep. and only do it for probably a certain period of time mm -hmm. but like take a year yeah and just do it you know yeah that yeah. would be great 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 answer how about you uh, i don't know i don't know uh i i love the east coast i love being I love suburbia. I love being close to a city, but I don't really want to live in a city. Mm -hmm. um, the easy answer for me is Jersey because that's where my family is. You can't you can't say Jersey? Uh, but I love Jersey. <laughs> and then my next best answer would probably be Kentucky because that's where my family's originally <laughs> from. <laughs> I'll, I will say this: uh, I, it would be great to get away from the humidity mm -hmm. of the Mid Atlantic. Yeah. This humidity sucks. <laughs> like, it really does. So, and there's a huge contingent. Well, I don't know if it's huge, but there's a large contingency of uh, Towson Presbyterianers who swear by Maine. 
Yeah. And that yeah, does sound right. very appealing. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It really does. It actually does for you, yes. It sounds very appealing to I me. I could see you in Maine, absolutely. You grow a beard and... <laughs> <laughs> Gotta start liking lobster, though. All right, here we go. Next one. Tell us about a time that you failed. Oh, my God. Holy crow. How much time do you have? Mm -hmm. Just need one. Okay. Time that you fail. Uh, oh, there's so many. I know. Because <laughs> there are so many for me. Oh, man. But how about, and there's a B to this question. All right. What did you learn from that failure? Okay, I'm going to give two. Um, the first one was when I was trying to get ordained in our denomination. And what happens is you not only have to pass all of your, your school classes and get your divinity degree, you also have to pass your ordination exam. Yeah. And there's five ordination exams. And so I passed four. Are there five? Yeah, the, I, I passed four out of the five mm -hmm. and then had to retake one because mm -hmm. I failed it the first time. Mm -hmm. And that was okay. Um, but then beyond that... Um, you have to pass basically what amounts to an or an oral examination by your presbytery's committee on preparation for ministry, where they where my CPM committee on preparation for ministry. It's the um, least enjoyable part of the whole process. They put you through the ringer on theological questions and pastoral questions and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, and I remember in a presbytery meeting. Well, this well, you have the CPM meeting, and then you go before the presbytery. Yeah. So I was still in my CPM meeting, and I was asked the question of, why did Jesus have to die? Mm. And I started responding with what is known as the sat uh, satisfaction atonement theory, and I started offering that, yeah, explaining that we don't need to get into it here, but explaining that. And in the middle of it, I kind of just got to the point where I realized. You know, I don't believe in satisfaction mm. atonement theory. In the middle of of your explanation, you know, and your I'm answer? saying it, and I'm like, no, no, and I just stopped. I just stopped answering. Mm. And they were trying to be very gracious. Yeah, and they said that's okay. Start over, because I was giving the cor I was giving a correct answer on this, right? Yeah. And I just said, I, I just stopped. I said, no, I'm not going to answer that. I just didn't answer the question. And not recognizing in the moment, like, no, Rob, you really need to answer the question. Still answer but, like, it. the profundity of the question, right? And that I would be, what caught me in that moment was kind of like my very human hubris, my arrogance to say, oh, yeah, well, I know why Jesus had to die. Yeah. Like, oh, my gosh. Like, that is... Right. Right. So I didn't like like no, I like I don't really think I should answer that like yes. just my yeah. the eternity of that question and the finitude of me just whew, came all funneling down to me in that moment. And I just said, I can't answer that. Mm. And I <laughs> went ahead this. So I they asked me a bunch of other questions and I answered all of them, and then they kick you out of the room. And they vote on whether or not you're going to be ordained. And like, it's, I was, all my other steps through this process were quick. And after five minutes, I'm, okay, I'm 10 minutes, I'm 20 minutes. Yeah. And after 30 minutes, I'm starting to get nervous. <laughs> like, what is going on? Like, yeah. and all of a sudden I begin to realize I should have answered that question. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah. my gosh. Like, I didn't answer. So they called me back in and they approved my ordination and the CPM chair leans over and puts her hand on my knee and says, Rob, next time just say to atone for our sins. Mm -hmm. I was trying to make it like this big and precise answer and all they wanted was a general kind of they, Jesus death is salvific. They want you to know that you're within the reform tradition of theology yeah. that's that's it that you're not yeah. some loose can <laughs> and so i failed to answer the question but i was still given grace and then there was one other time because this is also related 
And it was really good for me. Um, the very first time I ever had to do communion by myself, I began as an associate pastor. And there was a time on a communion Sunday when the uh, senior pastor wasn't present and I had to do it <laughs> by myself. And or in, in this process, we, we serve elders who then go out and, and serve communion to the congregants. It's a little bit different at that church than it is at our own. Um, and I gave all the elders the wine first to then go out. And the mm-hmm. order was bread and then wine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like the elders like, it's the bread. And I'm like, just go with it. Just go with it. You know, like, just go with it. And then after the worship service, a sweet um, elderly woman came up to me and said, uh, Rob, you serve the wine first. The bread needs to go first. And I said, oh, yeah, I know. Did you like that? And she said, no. No, I did not. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> what was the learning moment for you in that one? You, you shared the first one. That it's always going, like, I, I would use, I've said this to seminary interns, <clears throat> that the best thing you can do when you're leading worship is to fall flat on your face. Mm-hmm. Make a mistake that is so obvious and, um, you know, kind of so uh, a lot of our mistakes we can kind of finagle our way around, you know, where they're so quick or small that some people don't notice them. But I said, you know, you need to make a mistake that's huge that you can't you can't fix in the moment and that everybody is very well aware that you made the mistake because you will realize that worship is not about perfection. Worship is not about um, doing things exactly right. It is mm. about giving your thanks and your praise to God. So when you fall on your face, you'll realize that it's okay. We're, the worship service will continue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well said. Um, How about you? Uh, I'll share one because it, it popped up in my consciousness recently, which is odd that it did. But so after... Again, we're getting into seminary stuff. After seminary, before I was ordained as a pastor, I had a friend who um, was a pastor at a church somewhere in Jersey. I can't remember where. And she was away. She asked me to fill in. I'd already gone down once to fill in to preach. And uh, it went really well. And so I said, yeah, I'll do it again. So I was working full time. So I was writing a sermon at night. Mm. Uh, We had a newborn. Micah was newborn. I'm not a, like, at night. I'm not really clicking on all cylinders. So I wrote the sermon, thought, wrote it, I'm done. And then got up Sunday morning and started driving down, about an hour drive. And so I'm driving and I got my sermon right here and I'm kind of, oh yeah, I should just kind of look through this again. You know, I'm just looking through it. I get probably two thirds into the sermon that I had written and realize it's, it's just a bad sermon. It, there's no real main point. It doesn't kind of flow there's nothing that is calling people to an action at the end and i remember that kind of terrified feeling of i have to go preach this i have to preach this in 20 minutes and it's a bad sermon and i'm just going to be honest it's a bad sermon and this kind of resignation of here we go so I offered it. It stunk. <laughs> I was never asked to come back. But, you know, I've thought about it since then. And two things have come up as I've thought about it. One, and this has helped me now, is, all right, even if I think I'm done, i got to look at it Saturday night. Often I've looked at sermons here Saturday night and went, oh, I have another hour of work here. And i got to... I gotta bang this thing out. I, I I gotta push through this thing right now because it is not working. Um, <clears throat> so that has helped. Second, I've often wondered, like, what if I just owned it that morning? What if I got up and said, "Hey, everybody, my sermon really stinks," <laughs> and so let's do something different. Or let me tell you a little bit about me and my journey of faith. Let me do a testimony or something. I mean, it was guest preaching, so it's a little different. Mm -hmm. A small little church. You know, you you Mm -hmm. have opportunities to be creative in that point. Mm -hmm. Like, instead of just kind of 
resigning myself to here's my sermon and it stinks. What else could have come out of that moment if I was a little more honest and open? I don't know. I don't know. So um, it's a good question. It, it's helped me to kind of go, okay, maybe it would have pushed me just to throw it aside and just see what comes up as I spoke. I don't know. And, I don't know. you know, so it's kind of like you don't have to always say, here's my. <laughs> yeah, this is, we have to fit, you know, the the round pegs and the round holes and the square pegs. Sometimes you don't. Holes, yeah. Sometimes those are opportunities. To do something different. Something different. different. And actually, I mean, that's how the spirit often works sometimes. You get, you get out of the way and. The Holy Spirit comes in. All right. My question for you, real quick. Yeah, and I got one last don't, one Don't take you. as long as you took my last one. Okay. Uh, if you could only eat one cuisine for the rest of your life, what would that cuisine be? It's easy. Mexican? Tacos. Yeah. No, oh, you. I was going cuisine. You're saying you're going to specific food. It's tacos. It's tacos all the way. Tacos. All the way. Mine would be Italian. Yeah, we have a different kind of level of questions we're working at here, you know? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Last question. Last question. No, you have another. Right? Two more, it looks like. Well, I'm going to skip one. Okay. Um, it's a two-parter again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's the best part of the journey of faith for you? What's, you're still doing this after all these years. What's the best part? Uh, I don't know. What keeps you doing it? Uh, it's not that I don't have answers. It's like the best. I, I, how do you pick out one? Just pick out one. Sharing it with you. <laughs> <laughs> Your answer to my to part B could be the same. What's the hardest part of yeah. the journey of faith? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I would say, um, A, I do love sharing it with you. Um, and I'm really grateful we get to work together. Uh, the, the very best part, well, there's so many. Just pick one. There are many. I agree. Uh, what, what rises to the surface right now? Getting to see the new, mm -hmm. um, being in a position that pushes you regularly to look for the new, the new life. Um, the new gifts, the new opportunities, the new. Um, and I think the journey of faith perpetually calls us to see the new life to which God is calling us. But I think working in a church, we're also in kind of a unique position where we not only get to do that for ourselves and our, you know, our loved ones, but, you know, that's one of the things we're perpetually striving to do in our church work is... Yeah look for the new yeah so yeah yeah um and that's also probably the struggle right yeah. it is yeah it's awesome but it's also hard and frustrating and it's really frustrating when you have a a, a strong sense of of where god is leading or or what god is calling you to do but it's hard or the, there's not enough resources or frankly you just don't know how yeah. um yep. yeah uh yeah and, and you're never there. You're never there. Yeah. Uh, and again, that's part of the good and part of the bad, yeah. right? There's never a time when you just get to, hmm, we finally arrived. <laughs> the hard work is behind us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Time to sit back and enjoy the fruits. Because part of the journey is enjoying the fruits, right? Mm-hmm. But it's also realizing that you're not there. Hmm. Good answer. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would also say, in a similar way, the new in that um, uh, experiencing and learning new ways to look at faith. Mm -hmm. You know, so in the previous podcast, we had the question about... Um, the concept of hell mm -hmm. um, and how when I started 
and as this person is doing too, ask that question, asking that question um, about it, critically asking it. You know, that led to new ways to think about God, deeper ways to think about God. Like it's that it's that new that keeps faith alive. I think keeps it from being stagnant. You know, you keep thinking and experiencing God in the life of faith in new ways. Amen. Well and said. that keeps yep. it that keeps it and you moving. And the hardest, I think, is uh, that it it never I think you you said it too. Uh, just in a different way of saying it, I'm going to say it. You never arrive. You never kind of go. Ah, I got it. This you, is who God is. Or or and I've figured. Or I've yeah. I've I've arrived as a person of faith. That's why you come back every Sunday, and you go. Oh, okay, gosh. <laughs> here comes a confession, and I'm reading that, and I'm going to need some silence here to offer up my confessions, you know, um, and I'm going to need to hear the assurance of grace, you, it, it, it always challenges you. It always challenges me. It always is, yeah, I really don't have a clue when it comes to loving people. <laughs> I, I, or I, I you have... get it wrong most of the time. I have some steps in that direction, then I go, yeah, I'm just still learning. I'm still learning how to love people at the depth of what we are invited into. Mm. Um, you know, that it's it's that is I think that's what kind of keeps pulling me along, but it's also the just challenging part of you kind of go <sighs> you just come every week, at least I try want to. I want to with kind of these empty hand these open hands of I gave it a shot, and I'm gonna try again <laughs> next week. You know, that. But that, that's the hard. It's 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 a. There's a positive side of that, but it's also, I think, just the hardest part is, you never fully arrive. Like I think we're we're both saying the same thing, just in different ways. Yeah, I agree. I you know? agree. I agree. Um, and that's I think what's ultimately life giving, about it. You know. It'd been really funny if I'd kept. I get to work with you, and then your least favorite was, I have to work with you. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's one of my favorites, too. We have a good time together. Uh, Everybody, this has been... Thanks for being with us. Yeah, we We appreciate appreciate it. it. We're going to come back again soon, and we're going to follow up on part one of this podcast, which was on the question of hell. And in particular, so if we are... Letting go of a um, belief in a literal hell, then what's the point? What are we called to do? What is this? Um, Why have faith at all? What's this Jesus movement all about? And I think that's a great question, too. So we're mm-hmm. going to explore that next time. Until then, this is Beyond Sunday. Joel and Ralph's podcast. We'll see you next time.